Well, Merry Christmas, River Valley. My name is Mark, one of the pastors here. It's just so good to see all of you here at this service and coming out to worship Jesus on this Christmas Eve together. And weren't the kids great? Kids were awesome. Yeah. Yeah, River Valley kids are the best. We love them. And a big thank you to all the leaders down there, Chuck and Allison and... and um, uh, Lynn, and, and uh, man, we have so many great leaders down there and the whole crew. Uh, thank you so much for all you do to get those kids ready and to, and to bless us with all the kids. And the title of this Christmas Eve message is God's Christmas Card. And, uh, you know, we get a lot of Christmas cards this time of year. I'm sure you do. We get a lot. And, and at our house, we pretty much divide them into three categories. And so there's, there's the cards Dana recognizes. There's the cards that I recognize, and then there's this other category called other, and we're not really sure who those people are, because <laughs> maybe like they got married and their last name changed, I don't know who this person is, or it was so long ago, or, or, or maybe it's because it's just a picture of their kids. I love their kids, okay, but maybe, I haven't seen their kids in a while, and I don't even know who these people are, right? And it's like... So, but interesting, that trend seems to be decreasing, like the kids only Christmas cards. And like, so on my like wall where all the cards and pictures are uh, this year, I was just looking at that. I'm like, there's like no pictures of just kids only. So Z, all my complainings paid off. I've been complaining about this for a couple of years. Like, I love your kids. We want to see the whole family, right? And uh, so I don't know if it's worked. I mean, they, they just don't send me their cards. I don't know. <laughs> That's probably uh, what, what's, uh, what's going on. But I always enjoy the creativity that goes into some of those cards. You know, like, you can see you're on vacation. You know, you can see, like, you're in Hawaii or it's a real good backdrop or, I don't know, green screen, whatever. Uh, or some challenging thing you're doing as a family. That's always a cool picture for the Christmas card. Uh, our family has typically tried to do something, you know, some picture. We didn't do one this year. Uh, but um, over the years, we've tried to put a Christmas picture together. Some of those have worked out really well. Uh, others, not so well. And uh, so I pulled out of the archives one that didn't work out uh, so well. And uh, I don't know how many years ago this was. <laughs> and this is, just, this is just a freak show right here. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm wearing, um, and the little house on the prairie lady next to me, the Tyler with the big hair out front, the leader, you know, and uh, then there's Nicole, and then the Cody, and it looks like Cody's taking a leak back there, <laughs> and then there's Natalie way in the back, like, no, no, Natalie, keep going. No, 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 no. Keep going. <laughs> Get out of the picture. Oh, it's just terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Came across some other, uh, some other good Christmas uh, card picks. Here's one. That's the acrobat family. I love the dog there helping out. And then uh, you got this, uh, this one here. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Send him back. <laughs> Pronto. And then, oh, I love this one, okay. From all of us. <laughs> so this guy, he's stepping out on faith that things are going to change this next year. There's going to be a hot babe there next year. <laughs> he's not happy now, but he's stepping out on faith. And then uh, last... This is priceless. The Apple devices. She's saying, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. No picture yet. So I did a little research on the most popular Christmas cards, the most popular inscription. Of course, Merry Christmas is the most popular inscription. But the Bible verse that is the top, if not one of the top um, inscriptions, comes from the book of Isaiah. And I'm... I'm betting that even if you don't go to church, that you've probably seen this on a Christmas card. You've heard about this verse, Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. One of the most quoted scriptures at Christmas time. How many of you have heard about this verse? You've seen it on card. Yeah, pretty much all of you. Today we want to unpack this, take a few minutes and unpack this powerful scripture. And, uh, and, and, and it speaks, it speaks deeply to us. I've asked my family to help me with this. And so I've asked uh, my son Tyler and his sisters uh, Natalie and Nicole and uh, they're going to they're gonna help me out here. Uh, our, our son, um, Cody, is flying in tomorrow, so he got a pass, all right? And their mother uh, would not be caught dead up here. So um, <laughs> it'll be the four of us. And uh, the, first, the first aspect is really, uh, you don't see this as, as much. It's sometimes this part of the verse isn't even on the card. And it's to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. And if you're wondering, like, what in the world does that mean? I have no idea. So Tyler is going to come and explain it to us. Actually, I have a little idea, but uh, Tyler knows better. So Tyler, teach us. I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, the context behind this verse, back in the days of Isaiah, uh, the people of Israel lived constantly under the fear of foreign oppression. You had particularly Assyria and Babylon, two of the world's great superpowers of the time, and they ceaselessly harassed and bullied the people of Israel. It got so bad that eventually Babylon would take over the entire country, killing many and, and bringing the rest into exile. Sadly, Israel's own government wasn't much better. The kings oppressed their own people, neglected the poor and the orphans, practiced child sacrifice, and led the country away from God. And so this verse arises out of a deep pessimism for the state of the country and the surrounding world. The prophet Isaiah, he offers the people hope. Backing up a couple of verses, verse 4 and 5 say this, The abuse of the oppressors and the cruelty of tyrants, all their whips and cudgels and curses is gone, done away with. The boots of all those invading troops, along with their shirts soaked with innocent blood, will be piled in a heap and burned, a fire that will burn for days. It was funny, I didn't see that on any of your Christmas cards. Uh, maybe Evans, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, blood and fire doesn't really go with the sentiment of the season. Uh, but, on the other hand, if you think of the way an ancient Israelite person would think, we could see how they would look forward to the day when oppressors and tyrants would be destroyed. When someone would finally stand up to the evil in the world. The solution to everything that's wrong. But Isaiah's promised savior, his promised solution is originally unimpressive. He says in verse 6, to us a son is born, to us a child is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. I can imagine the ancient Israelite originally hearing this. A child? How's a baby going to help us? No, we need a general. We need a war hero. We need uh, at least a slick ambassador, right? A child? Isaiah, you've really lost it this time. But Isaiah continues. You see, this won't just be any child. This is going to be the child through whom everything changes. This will be the child who will deal decisively with sin and evil in this world. This will be the child who restores not only the country, but the entire world. The government will be on his shoulders. And we believe as Christians that Isaiah was not crazy. That, that many, many years later, the promise is fulfilled as a young woman named Mary has a baby boy. And she names him Yeshua, Jesus which is translated to mean God rescues, God saves. There's nothing noticeably different about this baby to your physical eyes. There's no halo, no special glow. Unlike the, the, the hymn Silent Night, he probably cried. Undoubtedly he cried. You wouldn't know by your physical eyes who you were looking at. It reminds me of a time I was playing soccer in, in Mexico with some, some kids in the street. And there was this one little guy. He looked like he was four or five years old. And I was even afraid that he was going to get hurt playing with us. But he really wanted to play. And so we let him play. And, you know, I was a little worried about him. But early in the game, the ball bounced near him. 
And, uh, you know, he's like this tall. And so it's, you know, he's not that high. But the ball kind of bounces near his head. And he jumps up and does an aerobatic bicycle kick. It was just nuts. I was like, am I really seeing this right now? You know, it was crazy. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it was like a sports center top ten play. Uh, and, and, and how could this little kid produce so much athletically? And nothing I had seen in him previously could cause me to think that he would be able to do that. Nothing previously made me think this kid was remarkable, but I was wrong. And it's the same with Isaiah's promised child. He seems like any other baby. Yet we come to find out very soon in, in the narrative that amazingly, mysteriously, miraculously, this little baby is God. God with us. Isaiah's promised child, unexpected and originally unimpressive, has four qualities. Four qualifying qualities that separate him from any other government figure, from any other authority. And the first of which is that it says he's a wonderful counselor. A wonderful counselor. My sister Nicole's studying to be a counselor. And so we thought she might be the best person to address this one. So uh, wonderful counselor. Thanks, Tyler. Yes, he's right. I am studying to be a counselor. Almost done. <laughs> so I have to admit, the first time that I studied this, I went straight past the wonderful and went to study counselor. But we can't skip past the word wonderful. It's wonderful. It's, it's the same word used when Jesus or when the Lord creates the world. It's the same term used when um, the Lord parts the Red Sea for the Israelites. This idea of the marvelous wonders of the Lord. Wonder, it's this, it's this mix of awe, yet intrigue, the unknown but wanting to know more. It's such a powerful word. So how is Jesus a wonderful counselor? So keep in mind what Tyler was saying about the state of the Israelites and their state of oppression. Um, I think you, actually I know you and I can relate to this state more than we like to let on to ourselves and to each other. I think we all can look back on our lives. Maybe you're in it now or you feel stuck, you feel like you want a way out, you feel like you, there's, there's more but you're just not there yet or you're just struggling, this, this state of confusion, maybe sometimes pain and hurt. Um, keep in mind the theme of this passage is talking about light coming to, a, to the darkness, light coming in a time where, where the Israelites, they can't even see. Think about light. Light is life-inspiring. It's life-giving. Think about light as comfort, um, a, a comfort in the storm. Or light is like warmth in a time where it's cold. Or light is like hope, a reason to move forward. Light is such an inspiring term. So what does light have to do with counseling or counsel? So to counsel means to advise. In studying the character of God and from the beginning of the Bible to the very end, God proves himself to be all understanding and all knowing. He has all the wisdom. There's an aspect of God's deity in his, in his godness where he knows everything and in a sense he kind of withholds complete understanding from all of us. It's, it's this idea that if we were to know everything, we ourselves would be God. So we cannot understand or know everything. Romans eleven thirty three through 34 says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who can be his counselor? I mean, just look at those words. How unsearchable his judgments. What is that? What does that mean? What is that implying? This idea that we, we can't even search out the, the paths to his answer or his reasoning. We can't even understand completely why he does things or the reason that something is happening. Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it is the glory of kings to be able to search that matter out. So we know and trust that God has that complete understanding. Jesus Christ has that complete understanding in him. 
So if we put wonderful and counselor side by side, it's essentially saying that there's an awe and intrigue inspiring holder of complete understanding. Life has a way of bringing us to moments where we ask the question, why? Why is this going on? What's the reason? We all have asked this question. I know I've been there. I've been there recently too, and it's so hard. It's so hard. But Jesus, being the wonderful counselor, holds that reason, and I know that I can go to him for that, and you can go to him for that understanding. John 1 says that in Jesus' life, and his life is the light to all mankind. Colossians 2 says that Christ holds all wisdom, all knowledge, and all understanding. So the birth of Christ is this picture of God coming to humanity as a light to show us the way in the darkness. And Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. So when we make our appointments with our wonderful counselor, do we see him as such? Do we see him as the way and the understanding that we need in our times of misunderstanding? His complete understanding transcends our limited understanding. We only see a glimpse right now, but one day we will be able to see fully if we trust in the name of Jesus Christ. So not only is Jesus the wonderful counselor, but even more, he is the mighty God and the everlasting father, which Natalie will be talking about. Thank you. I just first off have to say it is really rough being shoved in the back of a Christmas card. I just have to say that was rough. <laughs> okay, so there's this character. <laughs> okay, so there's this character in the Bible. His name is Job. And for some of you who maybe aren't familiar with the story of Job, Job's a guy who is having a rough time, all right? Job, uh, in this story, he, he has been afflicted left and right. His family has been afflicted. His possessions have been afflicted. He's been afflicted, and he is going through tragedy after tragedy. And it says that Job, he cries out to God, and he's like, Lord, like, what is going on right now? I don't know what's happening. This is really unfair. I'm a righteous guy. I don't get why, why this is happening to me. I demand that you break your silence and, and talk to me. And, and it says God finally he breaks his silence and and God says okay Job we can meet up and talk how about you bring your universe and I'll bring mine oh wait you don't have a universe oh wait where were you when I created the universe Job I span the heavens with my hand I, I tell the sun when to set you know I'm the one who wakes up the morning and you know what the lightning bolts they actually report to me so you know what Job I care about you and I love you but but I am God and I am mighty and I think I have it all under control right now. There's another story uh, out of out of Exodus 33 and and it, it's a story of Moses and and Moses is calling upon God also but Moses is like Lord I, I don't know where you're at right now I need to know that your favor is with me and I, I want you to show me your glory right now and God's like no no Moses you don't understand like you can't see my, my glory it's just too much for you and Moses says no God I want to see your glory show me all your glory and your might so, so God says, okay, all right. Well, there's a few terms first. First, you need to, you need to wake up early and go hike to the top of that mountain. Then you, you need to go over to those rocks and hide inside the cleft of the rocks. Not only that, but I'm going to cover you completely up. And, and not only that, but you can only see my backside. And it said that, that God passed by Moses and showed him a glimpse of his glory, and Moses was just trembling and terrified, yet so mesmerized, because he had just seen the glory and the might of God. And, and it says he was coming down from the mountain, and his face was just glowing because of this encounter. And this Christmas season, I'm reminded that that we we don't that Jesus was not only a, a baby who came to this world. He he was not only a child. He was not only one who came to be king. He was not only a wonderful counselor, but he, more than anything, at the same time, is a mighty, mighty God. 
There's another story in, in Mark chapter 4 when, when Jesus is in, in the boat with his disciples. And, and there's a crazy storm going on. The disciples are, are absolutely terrified. And, and they wake Jesus up who's apparently sleeping. They wake him up and they're like, Jesus, like save us. There's a storm. We're, we're scared. Like you need to save us. We're going to drown. And, and, and Jesus, you know, he's rubbing sleep out of his eyes. And he just calms the storm like that. And it says the disciples then, they were absolutely terrified. Oh, when the storm was going on, they were just a little scared. But after Jesus calmed the storm, then they were terrified. They were literally more scared of the rescue than the storm itself. All right? That's mighty God. All right? That's mighty God. Last story. I could probably go on and on with stories. Last story. Revelation chapter 1, we see this incredible, incredible encounter that, that the apostle John, Jesus' best friend, has with Jesus. And, and John, um, this, this is what he says. He says, when he saw Jesus, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His voice was like the roar of many waters. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the, the sun shining in full strength. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys. Fear not, I am the first and the last. Jesus is not only a mighty, mighty God, but he is the everlasting father as well. The father of eternity. And if he's the father of us all, I, listen to this. If he's the father of us all, if he's a mighty God, I can be assured that, that he, is, he has everything under control. He is mighty enough to intimately care about every single part of our lives. And you know what, you guys? He is totally worthy of all of our trust and all of our dependence and all of our praise. He spans the heavens with his hand. He spans the heavens with his hand. There's a verse I love out of 1 Peter 4.19. It says, may those who suffer entrust their souls to the creator of the world. May those who suffer entrust their souls to the creator of the world. That's amazing. Uh, these words, they're, they're very powerful and, and authoritative. And sometimes when we hear them, when we hear about mighty God, we think he's going to like tear our head off or something. But something that's super awesome is Jesus is also a prince of peace. Our whole goal in putting this service together with the teaching and the music and the kids was really that Jesus would just be so central in your in your hearts and in, in your worship. It, it's not so important what you you know what you think of the different teachings or or the kids you know how wonderful the kids are or how great the music was or whatever or what you think of Natalie's hat you know or anything like that. Um, but but that that Jesus is just amazing. He is so spectacular, and he just makes Christmas. He's what it's all about. This idea of peace, the Prince of Peace, you know, it's interesting because there's just not a lot of peace today, right? I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world, mainly vi visiting a lot of the missionaries that we have the privilege of working with and supporting. So I've been in all throughout Africa and been into, you know, Far East Asia and Central Asia and Central America and Europe. Everywhere I go, I see the same thing, conflict, turmoil, people who just can't get along. And it's true in big cities, and it's true in rural backwater areas, and it's conflict in families, husbands and wives, it's conflict, parents and kids, conflict in business, conflict in governments, conflict in ethnic people groups, conflict in churches. And, you know, it's just like you get here in Grants Pass, you get off the plane, get back here in Grants Pass, a wonderful community, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, but there's conflict here too, right? Even River City here, you've got people, same thing, families aren't getting along, and you got, you know, tons of crime, and, and, and you've got, you know, we got political fighting, and we have, 
you know, fighting in schools and we have neighborhood issues. All you get to do is just open the paper, right, any day of the week and you can see all of the conflict. And so we as human beings, like we're pretty good at that. We're pretty good at the not getting along part, right? We're pretty good at the war. There have been 15,000 wars in the last 5,000 years. And those are just the ones we know about. So we're good at that stuff, but we're not so good at just getting along in peace. It's this idea of Jesus being the Prince of Peace. And we need this. We need him. And not just peace as some feeling or some state of mind, but, but peace as a person. He is peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And, and there's two words in the Hebrew, sar shalom. And sar is where we get the word czar. Czar means chief or captain. I, I like that. Jesus is the czar of peace. Shalom, the idea not just peace, but wholeness, tranquility, rest. So Jesus, the captain, the czar of peace and wholeness and rest. And the Bible talks about three kinds of peace. Christmas is about all three. And I'm going to give you quickly these three aspects of peace. And the order is very important. And, and this speaks to all of us here today. Okay, And the first the first peace, with Jesus is the Prince of Peace, the first kind of peace that he gives, so, so important, is peace with God. Peace with God. This is spiritual peace that every person must have in their life. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the Bible makes it very clear that if you're trying to live your life without God or apart from God or pretty much on your own, like I don't need him, I don't want him, I don't need to be a Christian. I don't need, don't need to be a follower of Christ. I'm going to kind of do it my own way. The Bible makes it very clear that you're an enemy of God. That you're at enmity against God. There's conflict between you and him. You're like, wait a second. What did I do? I don't feel like I'm an enemy of God. I just don't really want to follow him. But I'm not really his enemy. What did I do? You were born. That's the fact. That we're born with a sin nature. It happened with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Bible makes it super clear. We read this in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. So every person born is wired with that sinful nature, it's in the, like in their DNA. And then we prove it by sinning a lot. Right? I mean, nobody has to try to sin. Right? It actually, you're looking at me like you're all spiritual, right? I mean, we all know, we all know how, the, how easy this is. And it's because we have that, that's just kind of our nature. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Now, I mean, we can do some good things, of course, apart from God. But the righteousness that allows us to actually be in his presence, to live in his house... To have a relationship with him can't happen. There's no one righteous, not even one. All have turned away. And the way of peace, they do not know. So naturally, people don't have peace with God. That's the bad news. The good news is Jesus has come to be the mediator. This is the whole point of Christmas, that he's come to make a peace treaty. It's so clear in Colossians 1.21, it says, you... You were once far away from God. You were his enemies. And so I'm, I'm not like making this up. This is like right from the heart of God and from his word. You were once his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you, from, he has brought you into his own presence and you're holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. So his death in his physical body, the cross, I like to say that the cross allows us to go across from our side of the chasm, which is separation from God, across that great chasm. No one can cross on their own. You got to go across through the cross of Jesus Christ to have a relationship with holy God. And that happens according to Romans 5, 1 and 2. It happens not by church attendance, not by religiosity, not by trying to be good enough. It happens by faith. Only through faith in what Jesus has done for you. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through a really good life, 
Is that what it says? No, through faith, made right through faith, we have peace with God. Here it is, finally, spiritual peace, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by being a really good person. No, through faith. Now, of course, we try to be a good person, but that's, that's because of our faith in Christ. And he makes us right, brings us peace with holy God, that grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so my concern, been praying about this, been on my heart for all of you here. A lot of you here I don't know, haven't met yet, and I just want to make sure that you have peace with God. You don't want to stand before God as his enemy. You want to make sure that your sins are forgiven. I point this out all the time. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Forgiveness of your sin that Jesus provides if you accept his free gift for what he's done for you on the cross. That gives you peace with God, spiritual peace. That's the foundation, guys. That's the big deal right there. And then when that happens, you get number two, the peace of God. Because, again, he's a person and Jesus comes to live in you. And so his peace will come into your heart, 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now, may the peace, the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. John 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I mean, the world, they, they do the best they can to try to provide peace and to try to bring peace and to try to teach inner peace and peace with one another. And, and I mean, it only goes so far. Jesus says, I give you a peace that the world knows nothing about. I give you the real deal. And you who are Christians here, you understand this. You know, you've gone through tough times. You've gone through those storms. You're like, how come I have a, a peace in my heart? Like, my, my world's falling apart, but I, I just have kind of a calm. I have a, I have a sense of the Lord's presence in me. That's what Jesus does. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 16, I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. So Jesus is a realist. You will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. So that, that relationship with him, that allows his peace to take control over it and when it doesn't make sense. And now maybe you're here, you're a Christian, you're like, Mark, how come I'm so uptight and anxious and stressed out all the time? And that's a whole other message you don't have time to get into. But I will say this, that it has everything to do with our worship and our prayer. And the Bible says if we're focused on him, and we're not focused like on just on us and our stuff and the people around us. There's a lot of finger pointing we can do and a lot of grumbling and complaining and stress and fear. But if we're focused on Jesus, okay, if we worship, then we're not going to worry as much. If we pray, we're not going to panic as much. That's just a given. So that's where that peace comes from, the Lord in us. Now, once you get the peace with God and then you get the peace of God, that leads to number three, peace with others. And Jesus said, said it like this in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be called the children of God. Because if you know Jesus, then you're going to typically be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker at home. If you have a relationship with Jesus, like Jesus lives in your heart, you'll typically be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker at work or at school. Because that's what he does. Because, again, it's him. He's a person. It's peace in you. And, and we have an advantage in actually being able to love people that are hard to love. We actually have an advantage to offer forgiveness to people that are hard to forgive. Why do we have that advantage? Because he's in us. He's not asking us to do anything he hasn't done. What does he do? He loves hard to love people. What does he do? He forgives people that don't deserve forgiveness. So th this is what makes him so amazing. And it what's, it's what allows us to, to do a better job being at peace with each other. Cutting each other some slack. Maybe being the first to initiate and to say, you know, I'm so sorry. Christmas is actually a time when some of these conversations potentially could happen. Maybe people that you're going to see tomorrow. And, and, 
and to take that first step. Hey, you know, I just need to apologize for something. And, and again, you can't control their actions. You can't, you can't change the other person, but you can take personal responsibility for what you've done and make an amends. And that's a whole other message. But I think about the guy in Home Alone, the scary man across the street. Remember him? And what does he do? He makes, makes amends with his son there at the end, end of the movie. There's a lady in our life group. True story. This week, she's traveling to visit her mom and to see her. She hasn't talked face-to-face -face with her mom for 12 years because of some serious friction and, and serious issues, and there's a reason for the boundaries and the distance. But it's just so amazing that, that she's asking for prayer because she's, she's going to initiate and try to make amends. And so Christmas, again, every day is a good day to make amends and to be a peacemaker, but, but there might be some, somebody in your life, and it's a letter that you're going to write. It's a phone call later tonight or tomorrow, and just to begin to build that bridge uh, with somebody uh, in your life. There's no greater gift. You think about Christmas. You think about all the gifts under the tree. Imagine if you were given a gift. Someone put a lot of time and sacrifice into this gift. Very, very uh, valuable. And, and you just like, no, I'm not going to open it. I mean, that's crazy. When we don't open the gift of Jesus for us, and make no mistake, whether you're a longtime Christian of decades or you haven't made that choice yet, you're right there at the line. Some of you are right there at the line. Jesus is a gift for you to be opened, to be taken. What good, what good is it to us if we don't say yes? To say yes as a worshiper of Jesus again here today and say, Jesus, I'm so sorry, man. I've been making it about presents. I've been making it about this and I've been decorating and different and getting so caught up in all the stuff and actually missing you. And like I said, you know, those, those here, and you haven't stepped across that line yet. Guys, today, what, what are you waiting for? This is your day to say, Jesus, forgive me. I, I say this all the time. I say, you know what? In order to qualify to be a Christian, number one, you have to be a sinner. You have to admit it. You have to admit, I need God. I need Jesus as my Savior. And I need his peace in my life. Peace with God and then the peace of God. And then a peace that will help me with other people. So let's pray together. First, I, 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 um, as our heads are bowed and as we're praying, if you're here and you're, you're right at that line, you've never stepped over and said, Jesus, I, I need you as my savior. Come into my life and forgive me. And I admit that I've, I've done so much wrong and, and I, I've realized here today that I'm an enemy of yours. And I need your, your peace, the peace that you give me with God. Come into my heart. Take away all my sin. Bring me into a relationship with you. And the Bible says all who call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. If you just prayed that prayer, <laughs> praise God. I congratulate you. I thank God for what he's done today to save you. And that you've opened the biggest gift you could ever open. And, and for the rest of us here that, who are already Christians and, and, and maybe you've been a Christian a long, long time. That, that today, once again, you would just say, Jesus, you're, you're my gift. You're, you're the best thing in my life. I have a lot of good things going on in my life. Or maybe you'd say, I don't have a lot of good things going on in my life. But if you've got Jesus, that is, he is what matters more than anything. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for your amazing love. We thank you you came, you actually came to us, a son, a child, came into humanity, Lord. It, it's mind-boggling mind what you did for us, and um, we thank you for these amazing characteristics that we've seen today in this little verse, this Christmas card to us. And so, Lord, I pray um, that as we leave, that we'll just be much more... Um, accurate worshipers, that our view of you will be so much more inflated in our minds, because that's what makes, makes life um, a, a lot better. And uh, so thank you, Lord, for what you've taught us today, and thank you for Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen.